After these things did King Xerxes promote, excuse me, I'm reading a very small print here. Um, Haman, the son of Amadatha, the Agite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. Then the king's servants, which were in the king's gate, said to Mordecai, Why are you transgression, thou the king's commandment? Now it came to pass, when they spoke daily unto him, and he hearkened not unto him, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand, for he had told them what he, that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath, and he brought scorn to the hands of Mordecai alone, for they had shown him the people of Mordecai. Wherefore, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Asherah, even the people of Mordecai. I should have read that. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Xerxes, they cast pur, that is the lot, before Haman to determine the day and the month until it fell on the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. Then Haman said to King Xerxes, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from all other peoples, and they do not keep the king's laws. Therefore it is not fitting for the king to let them remain. If it pleases the king, let a decree be written that they be destroyed, and I will pay ten thousand talents of silver into the hands of those who do the work, to bring it into the king's treasuries. And the king took his ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of Hamaditha, the Agite, the Jew's enemy. And the king said unto Haman, the silver is given to thee, the people also, to do with them as seems good to you. That when the king's scribes were called on the 13th day of the first month, it was written according to all that Haman had commanded unto the king's lieutenants and the governors that were over every province and to the rulers of every people of every province according to the writings thereof and to every people after their language in the, king, the name of King Azarius. It was written and sealed with the king's rings. And the letters, whoops, I think it's somebody else's turn. And the letters were sent by couriers into all the king's provinces, provinces to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their possessions. A copy of the document was to be issued as law in every province, being published for all people that they should be ready for that day. The couriers went out, hastened by the king's command, and the decree was proclaimed in Shushan, the citadel. So the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Shushan was perplexed. I don't think you can get anything closer than Daniel 11 and Revelation 13 here. It's, it hits you in the face. Okay, so tell me about this in Revelation 13. Well, think about Revelation 13. If you don't pay homage to the beast, you know, you mm -hmm. can't buy or sell. And actually, in Daniel 40, um, um, he, the king of the north basically, you know, just rolls over king of the south. And he takes all the gold. He takes all the land. You know, he consumes everything and basically, you know, he goes out in, in an incredible wrath to destroy the holy people. I mean, it's just kind of, and it just hits you in the face. At least it hits me in the face. Well, I guess if it's a repeating pattern, it's going to repeat in our day too, right? Oh, let's not talk about that. <laughs> 
Well, it's true. I think that um, many of the um, steps that are being taken right now in terms of, I'm not going to get into politics, but many of the policies that are being established right now are basically to set up to basically confiscate uh, property in general. And I think it will sugar down to, um, to, to those who follow um, um, uh, God. I think that it's all being set up right now. Yeah. So this Haman, the Agagite, do you remember the King Agag? Agag? Yeah. It was like the King of the Amalekites. He got and stabbed that, in the stomach. History with. with was it Ob 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 uh, I'm He was a relative of his that survived. It wasn't supposed to, right? Right, but the the Amal Amal Amalekites and the Jews had a pretty long history of problems. So it's not really I don't know. I mean, in the Old Testament, you read a lot of times people bowing to other people. you know, as far as other kings or political people. And it doesn't seem like that was necessarily forbidden. You weren't supposed to bow to anyone as a as another god. Respect. But certainly people bowed to other dignitaries in respect. But it almost seems like... Um... Was the king um, requiring that? Was it Haman? And, and in that way, was he then trying to usurp the king's role and um, placement? Hmm. Yeah, because it really didn't say it was a commandment to bow to Haman. He was just, you know, given a, a prominent place. Right. But... You know, there's something about the man that Mordecai obviously did not respect, and he wasn't going to bow or pay homage. I'm sorry, it looks like the king did say that. In verse, oh, did he? In verse yeah. The king had so commanded concerning him. About, oh, yeah. So, yeah, that they would have. Uh, Mm. Uh, to bow in reverence. Mm. Well, that was uh, Mordecai here is like um, Azariah, Hananiah, and Michelle and Daniel, mm -hmm. huh? They would mm -hmm. not bow. Yeah. And they did ask him. I mean, all fairness, you know, why are you not bowing down? And yet, we don't seem to get the answer. Although it seemed like Haman didn't notice. You know, his, his the people loyal to him had to kind of come and tell him. Well, he was too busy with his chin up in the air. <laughs> well, if we remember, he told Esther not to tell or disclose that she was a Hebrew. And um, he himself, I wonder, um, didn't want to um, disclose that. It says in verse four, came to pass when they spoke daily to him and hearkened not unto him, unto them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matter would stand, for he told them that he was a Jew. So it becomes known now that you know he's he's a he's a Hebrew. And it looks like in verse five, Haman really pushed the matter by, you know, um, facing off with Mordecai and wanted to see for himself whether he was gonna bow. Mm -hmm. Well, Mordecai must have done a witness there and thought that he only bows to the God of heaven, the creator. 
that we're not seeing between the lines here because we're getting more to Gaia's maybe view here because at the end, he's clearly taken out on Mordecai and he's taken it out on the whole Jewish nation. So there's something that, you know, he brings before the king, you know, this whole people, you know, they're, they're worshiping another king, not you. So I think between the lines, you can see that that was the reason he refused to bow. Well, would uh, Mordecai bow before King Xerxes? I suspect so. You know, I mean, I think it was the character of Haman that Mordecai was refusing to. Honor. He refused to worship the beast. Right. And when well, Haman went after when Haman went after him, worship wasn't mentioned. It was mentioned that the people, the laws were different. They don't keep the king's laws. That, but it's not said anything about what, what or who they worship. It doesn't say they aren't of our religion or they don't worship who we worship. But I imagine it was known who the Jews did worship. Well, it does also talk in Romans in the last chapters there to, you know, to respect the authorities. And maybe that's a sign of respect, as I think uh, Laurie was saying. Um, but I wonder um, that um, Mordecai not bowing, um, that he knew Haman in some way and wanted really to expose um, his character. Yeah, you know, it's a tough thing when you put your own life on the line, but when he found out that he put his whole countrymen's lives on the line, that's a, that's a tough burden. Well, um, you know, um, that you would see that anyhow if, if in the Randolph Church, if um, you decided not to bow or follow something, it would affect us all, would it not in the Randolph congregation? Yeah, I suppose, but I don't, I don't know. I don't know if you... <laughs> You really think he's going to go after your whole family and everyone related to you? You know, I mean, that's quite a stretch. I mean, that's that's quite an ego. <laughs> you, know? you, you, know, you, just... you don't think the beast is going to, um, that comes out of the uh, um, ground, is going to come after everybody um, that's connected with you? Oh, yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I if, if they're... I, I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about verse six? What, what about verse six? What does that have to do with all this? But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom, mm. the people of Mordecai. So he won't even touch him. What, what do the other scriptures say besides scorn? Mine is disdained. So yeah, he, he wasn't content with just one man. So there must have been something about the Jews and whatever he was told that, yeah. 
Well, looking at this in context, Mark, what's that? I was going to say to your question, looking at this in context, we can't forget that Esther became the queen and Haman might have had some um, ill will towards that um, selection and that she was put in a place of prominence. So we can't forget that in context of this. But I, I was kind of under the impression that he didn't know that she was a Jew. She, wasn't she told to not tell anybody that she was a Jew? Right, but that doesn't necessarily mean she wasn't found out. Right, as, right. As, um, Laurie said from the beginning that, uh, the, what did you say there, the, from the tribe of the Amalekites? So there's mm -hmm. a history there, Laurie? Yeah, so no, there's a long history of hatred. So they were talking about this in the fourth month, the first <coughs> month, and it wasn't going to happen until the 11th month or the 12th month. So they had 11 months. Mordecai needed 11 months to pilfer 10,000 talents of silver for each person who killed the Jew. So he, he had to start stocking up cash reserves here for the payout. I don't know. I think he was planning on getting all that money from the Jews. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, mm. you wonder about the king. You know, he must not have realized how many Jews were in his kingdom. You know, you get the idea. He thought maybe it was just a handful of revolutionaries or something, you know, because even the city of Shushan was perplexed. You know, everyone knew Jews. And I think they probably, you know, respected them and knew they were good businessmen. Um, and so I think just like that other king was kind of tricked by his staff to put Daniel um, in the lion's den. I, I think the king was a little unaware too. Yeah, we talked so, about that, how the yeah, kingdom so. dynamics are, um, that there has to be a kingly position, but that it's not necessarily voluntary, that Darius was kind of tricked into that kingly position. So then the, the kingdom dynamic could go forward, like there has to be one in each spot. Oh, so like the mob, so the mob influenced, who was it, Pilate to crucify Pilate. Jesus. So I think these people are kind of acting as the mob who tricked the king to yeah yeah no you're right i think the the elements of the kingdom have to be in place so and in verse eight he says there's a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples so i mean that doesn't make it sound like there's a whole lot No, there was the 10 tribes that, remember, that were scattered by the Assyrians. Um, and I know this is the Medo-Persian Empire, and you had the Babylonian Empire before that. But um, No, I'm not saying that that's a fact. I'm just saying that was the information Haman was giving to the king I that see. made it sound like there really weren't that many people. Oh. Actuality, maybe there were a lot. Yeah. Part of the deceptfulness, deceptfulness. And I think um, going back to verse nine there about the money, um, as you know, if they were following the principle, the, the Jews were not to collect usury. And um, Laurie inferred that they're good businessmen. Well, we remember what, what was Hitler so furious about and what did he use as the primary um, driving force to um, want to do away with the Jews. Their economy was sinking due to the um, 
royalties they had to pay from World War I, but the Jewish people were doing quite well business-wise in Germany, and they were attacked for that. And I would assume too that um, they were they were they were blessed, um, you know, in that captivity, because we know there are prophecies that God's going to deliver them from that captivity and return them. Um, and if they're following God's principle in captivity, I, I, w I would believe that God was blessing them. Mm -hmm. Now, now, when is this in the timeline? Is this the group that didn't go back the second time? The second, the second call. Who who had the last um, call? Anyone remember? Was it Ahasuerus or was it uh, Artaxerxes? Um, I think it was Artaxerxes because you had Cyrus, then Darius, then Artaxerxes, then I mean, excuse me, then Xerxes, then Artaxerxes. So Artaxerxes was the last wave, I believe. So, so this is somewhere in between. Yeah. Kind so this is middle. somewhere in between. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and sometimes we look at that as a negative thing. Well, why didn't they just pack their bags and head back to Jerusalem with everything else? But the plus side of it is, you know, he, he's he's kind of in the presence of the king um, and these people evidently seem to be respected as we have been talking about in the community so they're doing their job and that job is witnessing to other nations I think we as Seventh-day Adventists could be criticized for you know gathering at you know Loma Linda Andrews University uh, South Lancaster, Massachusetts, you know, we have a tendency to, to clump together um, safety in numbers, maybe, I don't know, rather than reaching out and spreading out. So, I mean, you can look at these people as, as the ones that have chosen to stay behind as they're still doing God's work and they're doing God's work in a place that, that needs them. Mm -hmm. And he does point out in uh, verse 8 um, that um, their laws are diverse from all the people. And he's referring there to, you know, the principles and the ordinances, statutes, and commandments of the Jews. Um, he's singling them out in that respect. Um, the other thing we might want to consider about these folks that stayed behind is maybe they understood that there were going to be three calls. They did have the writings of Jeremiah and um, so forth, Daniel, right? well, maybe not Daniel, but maybe some, mm -hmm. you, you think, or, or I grasping? No, it's quite possible. They would be a light to the Gentiles. As well as, you know, like, like Lori said, if they were good businessmen, they may have been, you know, um, collecting funds for the building up of the city. You know, because remember, it came, they came in three waves, right? The first was what? To build the temple. The second... Well, the first one was for the people, the second one was for the temple, and the third one was for the establishment of the nation, right? Weren't those are the three calls? Something like that, I believe, yeah. I think you guys are being very generous and kind. I think they were just too comfortable to get out, and this is their wake-up call. <laughs> you stay in enemy territory, I told you to flee to the mountains. <laughs> well, so we're to flee to the mountains, or are we going to stay here? No. No. <laughs> yeah, we should. That's our mission. Not at some point. At some point, you're told to flee to the mountains. <laughs> yeah. Oh, like hey. more people are fleeing to the cities instead of to the mountains. <laughs> but Laurie, the so, New Testament tells us to be kind and gentle. So <laughs> then, I keep trying to tell Laurie we are already in the mountains. 
<laughs> so we should go back to the city. We need to get out of the city. According to, to your <laughs> philosophy. Yeah. Just when you back. flee to the mountains, remember to buy a team of huskies, because I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> You kind of have a team of huskies. You just have to train them to pull a sled. Yeah, I want to go one way, I want to go the other. <laughs> In first eight, so, not only are the, their laws diverse from the people, but the, he's saying that they don't keep the king's laws. In what respect don't they keep the king's laws? We, we haven't seen anything at this point in time that they... Um, not respecting the Mede laws, Mede of Persian I, law. I think I think it's just back to verse two. The king commanded concerning him that people need to pay homage to him, and they didn't do it. So law, plural laws. What difference does it make? I, I think when you start deceiving, there's all kinds of stuff. So yeah, I think it was another thing that Haman was exaggerating. Exactly. Right. right. Pride. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to go back to this three waves thing. Um, do you think this this exhibition of force against the Jews was a uh, was a kind of uh, abomination of desolation? Now it's time to head to the hills. Uh, I think so. Yeah, that's very interesting take, Brian. Yeah. No, oh, I think you guys are reading too much into this. <laughs> <laughs> well, the whole thing got resolved through Esther, and I don't think anybody headed for the hills. So. Exactly. Yeah. No, I I think this is a story that takes place that's going to repeat itself. We've seen it happen before. And it's going to happen again, and it's just it's a pattern. We're looking for the pattern. I don't think it's trying to tell us when it's time to head for the hill. Well, we are, I, I think in the situation we are in that. But if there was a death decree, um, I think the instinct would be to head for the hills, wouldn't it? Well, Christ told them, Christ warned them about the abomination of desolation. Right. Tiberius came and then he backed away. And they knew it was time to leave. So maybe this is the first sign. And they knew when the next decree came, it was time to go. I'm just, you know, I could be reading into it, but it is interesting. Yeah. It's, uh... Think about the dynamics, right? And the, and the, the way it repeats through history. Mm -hmm. And do the other Jews that are dispersed throughout the provinces, do they know that Esther is a Jew? that she's here sitting at the right hand of the king and will have some leverage or some influence and impact on the king. Um, I don't think they could know that. I think it's such a miraculous God stepping in and intervening that who would have ever thought? So if you were a Jew and this is decree is being put out, where would you put your hope? Where would you put, I mean, you've already been taken into captivity and now on top of that, you know, you're going to be completely exterminated. Mm -hmm. Better be praying. But if you pray to the East, um, the temple's not built. But again, they knew that it was going to come to an end. That's what the prophets have told them. Right. So they had to depend on the word then, what they understood about the word, huh? And mm -hmm. only the word. Yeah, no, I think they did have to learn that even though the temple was destroyed, they still had a God. Amen. Well, the, the Solomon's prayer is all about that, right? If they look to the east and look from wherever they are in captivity and would God mm -hmm. hear their prayer, you know? Yeah. And Turn that's back. a temple. That's a temple now that um, is not a concrete linear thought. It's it's a temple that is um, 
it, it points you to heaven. It has to point you to heaven and not mm -hmm. that physical entity. Because that has been removed no different than when Jesus um, said in Matthew 24, you know, you know, this is going to be destroyed, you know, in three days, it's going to be a pile of stones. It's not going to, and he said, you're going to be deceived if you're focused on that. Right. I will write my laws upon your hearts and on your minds, said Jeremiah. They knew about the temples. I think verse 11 is very interesting because, you know, the money and the people are given to you. Do with them as seems good to you. You know, it sounds, again, just like in Jesus' time with, you know, Herod or Pilate. I get those two confused. Just it says, you know, I wash my hands of this. You deal with it. You know, it's like they're they're just given over that control um again, again it points out something about the king um I, I i shared last week that he seems to in some ways have no backbone mm. i mean he just seems to go with the flow mm-hmm But I think it's just that example again of the kind of the mob control, you know, the mob component to the yeah setting up the and look what he does in verse ten. There, he actually takes his ring off and he hands it over to Haman. Hmm. 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 Yeah, I think um, that they had to rely quite heavily on their advisors and trust their advisors and their uh, governors, et cetera, for what was really going on in the kingdom, et cetera. So they were actually quite vulnerable, weren't they? Yeah. Except well, if they were kind of busy with those 240 concubines, you know? <laughs> I can't imagine having more than one woman. <laughs> She's sleeping, so. I'm not sleeping. <laughs> 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 that kind of strikes me when you say that, that how easily he gave up his control. How did he gave up his brain. What, what do you well, you would, think, you would think if you're living in a kingdom where if you made a law, it can't be changed you'd be a little more careful about giving up the control right well we're witnessing that now <laughs> and and you know i'm going to jump ahead a couple of chapters but later on when when you know she goes into him he asks her what her request is and tells her he'll grant it up to half the kingdom. Now, he hasn't even heard her request. Now, doesn't that sound like Salome dancing before the king to get yep. John the Baptist's head? So, I mean, like, how stupid can you get? Tell somebody who'll grant the request before you even know what the request is. I agree with Jim. This king didn't have it too much together. Well, you know, I think it, I think for some reason, they think that makes them look like they have a lot to give and they're, you know, generous, generous. Mm. And yeah, you know, it's kind of a braggy thing. Except your mouth can get you in awful big trouble. Well, it cost John the Baptist yeah. his head. I don't think they think that way when they're on the top of the pile. I don't think so either. But it, it does speak to that, you know, as Brian said, you 
have your advices, you should pick them wisely. And when you're sober. Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah. It reminds me a bit of the self-indulgent um, Belshazzar, King Belshazzar, right? In Daniel. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Just kind of going with the flow and whatever feels good at the time. Feeding your pride, ego. Well, he sobered up in an awful hurry, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's interesting how, you know, the king makes a decree and, you know, you don't hear of anyone stepping up to defend the Jews. You know, it's like they're, you know, they're, they're all pretty silent, just kind of like they were in Germany, I guess. Um, and I think, you know, it's not going to happen for 11 months. So the, the shock and awe kind of wears off. And then you just kind of get complacent about it. And Do you think maybe they lost their heads if they disagreed with the king? Mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I, I don't know. I mean, or do you look forward to killing your neighbor so you can get his house and all his possessions and his gold? <laughs> I, I don't know. Or, or how about this? They were good. They were good Christian folks, and they just wanted to do what was right, so they kept the laws of the king. <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, you know, and these laws, um, as you said, they take time to be implemented, and you kind of become, you know, a little callous, right? So right. With the Jews in Germany. You know, it first started that, uh, you know, maybe the, you know, Jews could only go to Jewish doctors or, you know, they were, you know, they were implemented on a, in a slow progression. So people kind of got used to them and right. it became, you know, we just, it's the law, right? Um, yeah, it wasn't all of a sudden that the Jews were wearing yellow stars. It was a very progressive somewhat subtle but then became much more bold but it was a progressive um persecution of the jew uh during um hitler's um reign you know well and i i think that's that's what's tricky you know because the changes come slowly and gradually so you don't get everyone up in arms um and and i can see that so easily happen i mean today like jim said you know Gradually, your freedoms are taken away, and you just get used to the fact that you obey what someone tells you to do. New you normal. Have to, don't have to necessarily think it through; just do it. Well, you know, with without getting into current events, I'll just just one thing is that you know the um, parents that are up in arms regarding the um, what's being taught in the schools. You know, the National School Board wrote to. The White House and the White House then um, told the DOJ and the DOJ um, uh, began to identify some of the behaviors of uh, parents going to school boards as domestic terrorism. Uh, so they put this target on their back, which mm -hmm. is pretty concerning to put people in groups, no different than to the shame and embarrassment and the uh, demonization of those who are unvaccinated, whether you believe in vaccination or not. But the characterization of groups in certain yeah. ways is not mm -hmm. unlike what's happening here or what happened in, you know, pre um, during the, you know, uh, the brownie days of, of uh, you know, Hitler's time and his ascendancy um, into power. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The accusations can be deadly. Right. You put those kind of labels on people. I was going back. I'm just trying to find here. It looked like um, it, it on, in, um, uh, here it is, yeah, in verse 7, it says, in the first month, the month of Nisan, um, you know, that um, the 12th year King uh, Xerxes, they cast Pur, that is the lot, before Haman from day to day and from month to month to the 12th month. 
to the month of Adar, but it looks like um, when you go down to verse 12, the, this, this law, that, I mean, that was written was in, a, was in a matter of 13 days in the first month. Then were the king's scribes called on the 13th day of the first month, and there was written all that he had commanded. So he made a fairly, um, 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 he expedited this pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. There was very, no. Very and, hasty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think that was a, a factor of his rage and his wrath. Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the mob mentality. And he's the leader of the mob, is he not? Mm hmm driven by self selfishness who were the, who were the leaders of the mob um when pilot was offering to free either barabbas or jesus who were the who were the uh, instigators mrs white said there were demons there were demons in the in the crowd satan mm -hmm. So that, that that really was expedited in a really um, very short period of time. Uh, yeah. And I wonder how that relates to um, Matthew 24, that the slow progression at some point in time, it's just going to, um, you know, um, be a rapid um, um bold uh, expression of anger and rage that'll happen well we see that in in daniel right he hears tidings and then he right. turns to annihilate many and also forget who it was that explained this but when the two when the two extremes of satan's kingdom you know we will today we could call them the left and the right when they have to work together, the scribes and the Pharisees, it goes quite quickly because it falls apart quite quickly. So mm -hmm. Satan realizes yeah. it's only going to come together for a short time to mm -hmm. have the affected, uh, you know, to to uh, have the affected purpose, right? To to mm -hmm. uh, get that. Well, Leonard White said that the last movements would be rapid. Yes. Mm -hmm. And yeah, uh, and um. Well, 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 I get the reverse. And that similar, um, I don't have, I have this um, King James Bible I picked up, but in Revelation, it talks about you must prophesy again. Um, people recall what chapter that is? I thought it was chapter 10. That's what I thought too. But, um, But the idea that you were saying, Brian, about, um, you know, hearing the news from the east, um, <coughs> from the north, that it intensified the whole process. Yeah, it's uh, 10 verse 11, I believe. 10 verse 11. Okay, I thought mm -hmm. we yeah, Thank you. What does that say, Brian? 10, 11. Um, in, um, it says, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Chapter 10, verse 11. Right. And, you know, is, is the, I wish we could find a better characterization than positive and negative. But is, is the positive of this is that it does bring, um, bring prominence to the Jews um, and the impact that they then will have in terms of um, um, sharing the good news about the sanctuary and the gospel, that does it not, not in the end, it doesn't seem that way right now, but does it not kind of drive, um, you know, the, um, the Jews to take prominence in sharing about um, the glory of God? 
Yes, just like the uh, on the plain of Dura. Right. And that wasn't too many years prior. You can be sure that these things were remembered. Right. When we talk about the north and the south coming together for a little while, is that the little time of trouble? That's a good question. What What, what are your thoughts that um, that it that it would be? Well, I'm thinking that when Satan goes forth with wrath and this death decree, like um, it, it's like a small counterfeit of what the end is actually going to be like. So where does the idea of a little time of trouble and a big time of trouble come from? Mm -hmm. Is that not in the great controversy? Mm -hmm. I can't be sure of that. Uh, what's it referred to? Jacob's time of trouble, maybe? Is that Is what the little time of trouble when we're... Mm -hmm. Sure. I don't, of, I don't know. I mean, it's not the wilderness experience where we're growing. It's just kind of a prelude to... <laughs> Yeah, I just I I just can't remember what where that all came from. That's that's a really good point though, because that's similar. You could almost associate that with Jacob's time of trouble, right? Because that was part of his growing process. It was actually like the pinnacle of his growing mm -hmm. process. He finally mm -hmm. learned to trust God, no matter what. And, and just as we were talking about the progression of something that's more subtle and not really understood, the consequences of certain decisions that we're in the process of. I mean, if you're, if you're a fireman, if you're a nurse or a doctor or, um, you know, a um, paramedic, or if you're working in a factory and you choose not to get the vaccine, there's a lot of trouble there for you. You're going to lose your job. And so we're, we're seeing the, um, all these small matters that are happening. Um, if it hits home, it's, it's probably going to, you're going to experience it at a big time of trouble, but it certainly is the, um, the, the seeds are being sown and, and could be seen as the foundation of, of a bigger time of trouble to come. Mm. Mm. The birth pangs, as it were, <clears throat> versus the death decree, which would be the big time of trouble, right? Right. But it's almost when, uh, you know, he takes uh, the king off his ring, and uh, then in verses 12, he, uh, Haman seals it with the king's ring, it's almost like Pilate washing his hands, saying, I, you know, I have nothing to do with this at all. Mm -hmm. You know, he's washing his hands um, and almost, ex you know, ab abdicating his responsibility, the king, for what's going to happen, as Pilate did. Not that he could abdicate his responsibility. I mean, Haman, Haman seems like that beast uh, in Revelation 13 that comes out of the sea and it's the wound that's, that, that he seemed to have a wound that, I mean, he, he's resurrected as we see in uh, um, Revelation 13. But we also see, you know, when he finally destroys uh, the king of the south, I mean, he gathers all power, political, ecclesiastical, um economic economic thank you all of that i mean he completely now is he is not only um um, um, um uh, a spiritual leader he is he's a king he's a statesman and i'm sure that's how Haman saw himself too i mean he had the king's ring you know? exactly, exactly. yeah, yeah. 
and, and this is a spiritual warfare that he's going after the Jews. Mm. But he just seems to um, just, um, <laughs> I mean, he, he looks like the beast here. This is right. Sure, you know, um, acting out with the beast's principles, right? Yeah. He's not looking at others as better than himself. He's not looking at himself as a servant. He's looking at himself as the center of everything and wanting to be served. But and he's acting like he wants to help the kingdom. You know, he's doing this all for the good of the kingdom. You know, these people, you know, are revolutionaries. They're not following the law. So, you know, he's pretending that it's, it's not just about him. It's for the good of the kingdom. He's protecting the king. He's, he's pretending that he's protecting the king. Well, like I said, like I said, it's the it's the uh, principles of the uh, of the e evil kingdom, right? He's mm -hmm. lying, he's accusing, mm -hmm. he's manipulating, right? All for his own pride. Right. To Laurie's point, that's Fratelli Tutte. It's for the common good. What we're <laughs> doing here is, you're not part mm -hmm. of the common good, Jim. You know why aren't you doing, Brian? Why aren't you doing? This is for the common good. You're against the common good, so you, you're an outcast. You're you're perceived as um, not yeah. not wanting to um, um, support your neighbor. That's that's a perfect parallel because that's exactly the way Satan operates. It's the same way Hitler operated. He said, "Look what these people are doing within our society," and he accused them and. Um, from that, it just grew into the death decree. Same thing here with Haman and Ahasuerus. And no doubt, it'll be the same thing now. It's all for the good. Oh, yeah. It's all for the common good. This is the right thing to do. We need to save the planet. This is the right thing to do. We need to force everybody to whatever. But those people that stand on the principles of God's kingdom... You know, truth, love, and then freedom to choose. Those are the troublemakers. Those are those that, uh, oh, what was it with Isaiah? The troublers of the kingdom? Or was mm. that uh, Elijah? Yes, Elijah. And you have that concept today, and that, and again, with the notion of, equity and equity is about everybody should have the same outcome and so if you have more jim we're going to take from you so we can provide here and here and here and, and i'm not talking so much about um um wealth but the concept of stealing from somebody to give to somebody else that's the concept of equity and it really right. forces a very top-down um, way of uh, and coercing way of somehow uh, the thing that I need to do individually. I don't need the government to tell me how to handle my wealth in terms of my responsibility to my neighbor, that that's mm -hmm. my individual responsibility. But to make but again, a law and to do that and where they're pushing equity in that way, um, mm -hmm. It's, it's, that's not from above. No. Uh, you, you have to understand that our, our society has moved into a society of we don't care about our neighbor and we don't care about the poor and the unjust. It's about me and that I'm at the top. And so when a society starts going that way, uh, you, you can't leave it to individual choice because right. they're not making wise choices. That's not God's kingdom either. No, it's mm -hmm. not. Right. Neither, neither is coercion to to force your <laughs> to do. That's that's this whole con What was that, Jim? Oh, I'm saying coercion to force your hand to do the common good. That right. 
home is the place where when you go there, they have to take you in. That's not home. <laughs> You know, um, it's this whole concept of uh, paternalism that I know better than you do. We're, we're the smart ones. We're the successful ones. You're just the cannon fodder. We need to make the decisions for you. But the problem is, is this whole thing about, oh, yeah, we're, this is just for the good or the common good or whatever you want to call it. What it actually turns out to be is uh, character destruction, right? So I'm going to let you pass third grade or fourth grade or whatever all the way up through school whether you actually can do the work or not because well I don't want to hurt your feelings well the problem is is that the character isn't built characters are built when you go through difficult times and you learn and you grow so we're taking that aspect out of our society so we're growing this this um, generation that thinks everything needs to be given to them you know, it's that whole uh, concept that uh, you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, you teach him how to fish, he, he, can, he can eat for a lifetime. Um, <clears throat> that's what it's all about. You go through the difficult times in order to grow character. That's why we're having these difficult times now as Christians, as a people. It's to grow our character, isn't it? Well, Proverbs has many, many many sayings and adages to that effect mm -hmm. yep. about the one who um, is like um, lazy, I think the words used, uh, and that doesn't apply to everybody, but the idea of what you're talking about is to work with your hands with the gifts and talents God has given you. Mm -hmm. Right. And even, even Paul says, I forget, is it second Thessalonians? He says, um, um if if a man will not work he shall not eat yeah that's true. right so it's it's this whole kind of um actually i think it's i think it's referred to in in mrs white as a uh, a a pro protestant uh mentality you know we're growing we're becoming like god right we're becoming um independent uh sentient beings right we're learning, we're growing, we're learning to make our own decisions. And even to the point where we argue with God, right? Ask Moses or ask Abraham, right? Well, yeah. what do you mean? What do you mean you're going to kill these people? That's not like you, you know? You see my point? Yeah. This was a, it was all a test. And then and eventually they were both called the friends of God because they were learning uh, to make decisions the same way that um, God makes decisions out of love for people and understanding and patience and mercy and seeing others as better than yourself through meekness and lowliness, call the characteristics of God. You know, I think if we had had a mentality of godliness, truly, we wouldn't see the reaction swinging the other way. You know, there is such a thing as greed and there has been inequality but because of selfishness and, um, and greed, which has happened, and the reaction's the other way. I mean, you think about how did, how did unions start? They started because there was, there was unfairness. They were, they were not giving proper you know, wages. They were overworked, um, et cetera, just living in abject poverty. So they made rules because things weren't done in a Christ-like Christian way. So what we're seeing, I think, in society today is a reaction. Um, you know, both sides are at fault in different ways. But, you know, the mm -hmm. Bible gives um, the answer, as you're saying in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes <laughs> and other places. But there was always checks and balances. Yes, a man couldn't work if he didn't couldn't eat if he didn't work um but at the same time there was made allowances for the poor so you know we had every seven years the land was to rest um that was good for the environment good for the animals good for the poor so there was a balance which we d were not having in our society so but i agree with you you know I, but i think that 
we need to look at the big picture of why we're where we are. It, it is. Hi, Pastor. Hi, how are we doing? Good, nice to see you. Yes. But I think it's multifactorial. You know, mm -hmm. there, there are so many things that, um, that go into that, you know. <laughs> yeah. Certainly, um, the, 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 the taxes they take out of me, and I'm not complaining, but the taxes they take out of me, I wonder where, where is that all going? I have an obligation, and I know it's all centralized in that way, a local and a state and a federal, but, um, you know, <laughs> there's a yeah. lot that's going there to take care of needs, and there are needs. I don't deny that. And we yes. uh, have a responsibility as a community, as a state, and as a, as a, um, as a country to do that. But um, again, it's this it's so many factors there um, well i think we also need to understand that um this world all the kingdoms of this world are satan's and mm -hmm. so we also i think need to look at, at least i look at it from the perspective that we're being manipulated we're uh shown two sides um you know we're given two choices and those two choices are both wrong right king of the north king of the south that's right. And the glorious land, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, no matter no matter what happens, we're being manipulated, right? Mm -hmm. We're being oppressed, and our rights are being taken away. And I, you know, it's kind of just it is what it is. Mm. Right. Sounds like it's all going in the right direction. Absolutely. Um, we know that praise God being the other way. Um, of who's the oppressor, you know, for Bible prophecy, it's going to swing from one way or the other, and then probably back again um, until the king rescues us from all of these nations, all these kingdoms. In looking at verse 13, when it says, and the letters were sent by post into all the king's provinces, I mean, they had a good um, postal service there, that this was communicated to all, uh, um, not just um, the leaders, but right down to the neighbors. Everybody knew um, where the target was going to be pl placed on. Who was a Jew in your community, in your village? It was. Um, yeah. It was Let's not. Look at the end of verse 14. Yes. That they should be ready for that day. Oh, mm. my. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right right so there was going to be blood on the hands of everyone um mm -hmm. and yet uh, so the king seemed to want to wipe his hands like Pilate by giving the ring to uh haman um but um yeah it's um i can't imagine the terror that and the fear that was um created within the the Hebrew population it must have been mm -hmm. incredible um, but the bloodlust that was created in everyone else you know yeah, I mean it says the city of Shushan was perplexed but yeah. yet you know they're going to participate in this against their neighbors but the idea of uh, your point you brought up before too and again they're perplexed there's I, I would see hopefully there's some ambivalence at least they're going through some process and they're not mm. just going to and they may do mm -hmm. that, but that at least there's some thought process going on if they're confused and saying, gee, my neighbors, they've helped me out and you, we're, I'm supposed to take their lives now? Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. exactly. So there's this character building going on in the heat of all this, yeah. this situation, right? We see the evil kingdom growing up and we see um, God's kingdom growing up. Those that are going to build right characters are going to say exactly what you said jim no these are my neighbors mm. these are, these are people that have helped me out and that I've, I've helped out and i've done business with and they've been a benefit to our community why would do i you do see that? those people you, in this story these do you see the, those people are, those aren't the people um in um in in the spotlight here those aren't the people in power right right but what they're doing is they're calling on those that have that bloodlust, like you had brought out. It's it's the same thing that's going on now. You see, you, I, I interact with people 
that are just fine with everybody making their own decision regarding, you know, say the shot, right? But then there's others that are vehement and they foam at the mouth to think that there's people out there threatening my life because yeah. they're not getting the shot. So, so, so you see my point? Well, I think the word perplexed provides some, um, some space for thought and that um, you have to go through some decision making. Are you yeah. going to go in that way or not? If they weren't perplexed and they were buying this hook, line, and sinker, sinker, um, woe unto a uh, woe unto the Hebrew. Um, well, I I would say I'm sorry to jump in, but I would say that the reason that they're perplexed, the city is perplexed. See, throughout the scriptures, Medo Persia has been has been positive towards the Jews. Right. You know, Cyrus, you know, Cyrus gives a decree to rebuild the temple. So, you know, this is all the decrees and all the stuff going on. You know, Medo Persia has always been positive towards God's people and, and and towards the temple in Jerusalem. So I think that you know the perplexity here is that they don't understand why there's oh. such a a turn a hundred and eighty degree turn in policy here towards these people. Um, you know, that's obviously part of what I see in the text here. And I think it's the same idea is that, you know, towards the end, you know, like you said, you know, we have Adra and Adrians have all done all the stuff and, and people, I think people, there's going to be people that are going to be perplexed when, when all of a sudden we're painted as the enemies of the world, because we're standing for, you know, standing for the truth that we believe in the word of God, there's going to be some that are perplexed. Mm -hmm. But when Haman, but when Haman presented that to the king to get him to consent to it, he didn't say they were Jews or Hebrews. He said a certain people. Right. When the decree decree went out to the provinces, I'm sure it said who they were to kill. Sure. But it wasn't presented that way to the king. He didn't know who he was. He didn't know who he was condemning. He just. <laughs> Trusted, right. Haman, trusted Haman's judgment wrongly. So, or Haman is actually deceiving the, the king. And yeah. the, the same way that, you know, Daniel chapter 6, right, that the yeah. wise men or the other counselors deceive Darius to put Daniel in the lion's den. So, you mm -hmm. know, they're, and that's the what's going on. A lot of the kings of the earth don't really realize what they're doing. That's they're right. just along with the flow. So you, you're you going to hear this idea of saving the planet and we got to you know, the, you know, the, the economic thing, there's a lot of kings of the earth that are going to go along with the flow and not realizing what's going on. Yeah, do they really know what's in the bill that they're going to pass? Right, yeah. And that, oh. Well, he says that, I mean, it, this gets a, goes back again to the backbone of the king. Um, uh, you know, I know he has his uh, office, his cabinet to help him, but he says in verse 11, do with them as it seemeth good to thee, and yet he's making a decision without really having the facts and what's the rationale for what you're doing. And it speaks volumes about chapter one and chapter two about this king. He's, um, he's lacking. Well, like I said, it's, he did the same, he does the same thing a couple of chapters later right. when he, he offers to grant Esther's request and he doesn't even know what it is and that's just like Salome and how John the Baptist yeah. lost his head <laughs> well he, he may have some um Wernicke's Kosakoff's um setting in because of his um um you know um, proclivity to um ethanol and alcohol <laughs> well I think also one of the things that is different about Medes and Persia is that it states very clearly that the kingdom of Medo Persia was governed by law. Right. It's the law of the Medo Persians that doesn't change. And the king's role is not to be the lawgiver. He's actually the enforcer of the laws that are passed. So the so so the the Medo Persia kingdom has more of a uh, I don't want to call it democratic, but it's 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 a different sure. style. Than Babylon with a king that then you're used to, so 
Uh, again, so you see the same thing happen when the law is changed. Well, they can't just annul the law. Once the law is given, the law the law can't be changed. So he has to give Mordecai the ring to come up with a law to counter the law of the destruction of Jews because the law that the Jews are to be destroyed cannot be altered because the law of the Medes and Persians is the absolute authority. The king is not. So, you know, again, there's some food for thought in our thinking there. But when we think of Old Testament kingdoms, we usually think the king can do whatever he wants, but that's just not true. No. And that gives us insight also into the kings of this earth, that some some yeah. kings find themselves trapped in a situation, or rulers of countries find mm -hmm. themselves trapped in situations where they're actually carrying out policies that they don't even agree with, but they, mm -hmm. they have no... They have no recourse or control over it. Yes, that's right. And think about the mandates here in Maine. There's a lot of people that employers that don't really agree with it, but that's the law. So the employees are upset with the employers, but the employers are just con conforming with the law of the state. Right. Well, it's, it's actually not a law. They're just agreeing to the mandate. Exactly. It's not a law. Yeah. And the mandate isn't a law. True. Yeah. Right. But a lot of people think it is. Well, they're being conditioned not to question. So they hear yeah. a man think that means I have to do it. And so that's the, 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 the culture that you're in nowadays. The people are afraid to speak up or stand up. They just, they're just forming to whatever they're told. So they heard mm. the word mandate and they think I have to do it. Well, the president made that mandate here last month or whatever, didn't he? When he said that um, all employers of 100 employees or more had to ha make sure that all their people were vaccinated or whatever. He made some kind of a mandate like that. No, and, he, he was actually just no. calling on them right. to to back up what he is doing. Because the president of the United States has no power or authority. None. Over it. Right. That's well, not a lot of people, kind of like lot, the king. A lot of people are bailing out of their jobs because of those kind of mandates, because I know people that are, I know of people who are choosing to retire or leave their jobs because they either have to get vaccinated or get tested every week or you know, like my contractor's daughter, she got pressured into taking a vaccine she didn't want to take and then ended up her up in the hospital. And then she put her feet down and decided she didn't want any more vaccines and she ended up having to leave her job. So it's being repercussions all over the place. Well, and it's just their way of finding out who's going to be compliant, right? Yeah. And, and 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 that's the bottom line. And and then then they're gonna whittle it down to um, the rebels, <laughs> rebels of the kingdom. Lost the hair pretty much. When you look at first, when you look at first thirteen, um, I think about um, when God would tell the Israelites to wipe out everyone, children old woman, the feast, and everything. And Haman is telling them clearly that everyone is to be annihilated here. Young, verse 13, young, old, little children, woman, in one day. And when you think of one day, what feast do you think about? Well, not a feast, but what? <laughs> atonement. They have atonement in one day. This is almost... A reverse of the Day of Atonement in a, a if you will, a negative sense, is it not? Mm. A blotting out in a different way. And they're blotting out the mm -hmm. source of salvation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a good point. Mm. Again, again, you know, this is this is all for a purpose, right? God is allowing these things to happen for a purpose. He's, he's bringing um, 
he's bringing us to a point where we have to consider whose kingdom we're in, what mm -hmm. principles we're going to live by. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it seems, you know, that perplexity that in Shushan is, is for a reason, right? People are perplexed. So something's going on here. Why is this all of a sudden this switcheroo? And again, and how am I going to make my decision? Am I going to be one of those because I'm going to re be rewarded with the plunder? I'm going to do this thing? Or am I going to live by the principles of love your neighbor as yourself? It's so, all about character building. So, so um, I, I, I brought one of these up last night and the other thing, um, and it's uh, 5 Testimonies 452. God has revealed what is to take place in the last days. And if we're going to look at this towards Esther, his people may be prepared to stand against the temptus of the opposition and the wrath, right? Because this is what they were being prepared for um, in Esther. Those who have been warned of the events before them are not to sit in calm expectation of the coming storm, comforting themselves that the Lord will shelter his faithful ones in the day of trouble. While men are sleeping, Satan is actually actively arranging matters so that the Lord's people may not have mercy or justice. Who are you reading that from, sir? Um, five. I think it's five testimonies. Four twenty-five point one. And 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 the bottom part of that is, the leaders are concealing the true issues. Right. Right. Isn't that exactly what happened there? No. It's amazing. Um, oh, what's happening now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. See, I question when the second decree went out that told the Jews they could defend themselves, were they going to not defend themselves before that happened? Oh, yeah. They, they had no idea what was coming upon them. Well, I guess, Michelle, a follow-up question to yours is um, not so much... Um, in a literal way, how are they going to defend themselves? But spiritually, how would they defend themselves? Oh, gotcha. So um, I'd kind of like to ask the pastor, since he was able to, to sign in, if he could give us um, a summary of chapter three. It's a re, it's a replay. I mean, as I said before, the, the story of Joseph is the first one. Daniel's story, the story of Daniel is a repetition, and the story of Esther is a repetition of those two. Uh, so, what's interesting, the details are different in each, that bring out different aspects of what you're talking about in terms of how this becomes a type at the end, typology. Um, and the king dynamics here are obvious. Uh, you probably already have already talked about them, but. Uh, so, no, the, this is the center of the book when Haman is actually pushing his plot and pushing his agenda, and it looks like Haman's going to win. Um, but of course, where um, Mordecai is getting, going to start seeking God, and God is going to start moving. I, I, it's interesting that the, the whole idea that they cast the lot it's called, um, is very interesting. So, it's the first month when they cast a lot, and it's going to be, is it the 12th month or, month or whatever when? 11th. Yeah. No, it's the 12th month, so they have 11 months. Oh, okay. Sorry. That's, so so the God arranges a time a time element uh, in there for, for, God, for God to work, and God is going to work out the situation so that obviously Haman's plans are not going to be successful. And same idea going on that the leaders of this world, for example, have their idea about their time how they push the agenda. But God is going to overrule the timing so that the time actually works 
or God's, you know, to deliver God's people. So yeah. he, this is the this is the part of Esther where Haman thinks he win. Um, and so it's just a very interesting part. And to watch the king, again, as you mentioned, he doesn't say, it is really isn't Jews. What Haman says is that there's a group of people that are scattered amongst us whose laws, their laws are different than everybody else. And they don't, in verse 8, they don't keep the king's laws. So therefore, it's not for the, the king's prophet to suffer them. What happens is that Haman doesn't exactly do see what, what again the laws of Medo Persians is important in the kingdom of Medo Persians. So they he says that their laws are not in harmony with the laws of the king. And by the way, that's what they're going to be saying about us. That we follow God's law, and our law that we follow is in harmony with the laws of the land, right? Sure. So really, this is really kind of the center of the storm in terms of Haman's goal of thinking that he wins. But of course, uh, as we love to know, uh, Satan doesn't win. So, I like to follow up with, uh, with again, Ellen White. <laughs> says, Our people have been regarded as too insignificant to be worthy of notice, but a change will come. The Christian world is now making movements which will necessarily bring commanding commandment keeping people into prominence there is a constant supplanting of god's truth by the theories and false doctrines of the human origin movements are being set on foot to enslave the consciences of those who would be loyal to god the lawmaking powers will be against god's people every soul will be tested and that's exactly mm -hmm. what you see happening right now but also again you know he he Heyman just thought that that those people were insignificant he wanted to get rid of them didn't think that they were you know but but what happened is that like she says the change will come and that's exactly what we're living in right now that change is coming well, this is what happened in well jesus walked was the um the earth was the you know the uh, the traditions of um you know, the priest and what have you versus um, how Christ understood the law. And they were very divergent. And um, today, um, it's, it's no secret, um, uh, this uh, gentleman, Mr. Francis, um, he, um, he, he, he's very, um, he's an enemy to those who are um, very rigid about the scriptures that hold to the scriptures. He speaks very boldly about that in the Catholic journals, that um, he is against those who depend on um, the word and the word alone. I mean, that's uh, that's already been targeted or is being targeted. It's, um, it's right out there. Um, so can I ask the question, did you guys, did you guys talk the three parts of the kingdom so you could look at the dynamics between the parts and how it works? What? Well, we saw kind of the mob mentality affecting the king. We saw the three parts of Satan's kingdom. I'm not sure we saw three parts of God's kingdom, but. We can't hear you. Yeah, that's the place the Lord has given me to kind of break down a passage to look, especially something like this, to look at the three parts of the kingdom of both kingdoms and then watch, then look carefully for the dynamics between the parts and how the three parts come together. Um, because that gives you the mechanics of what's happening. And that's, you know, so that's usually in very insightful. Of course, Hank. Put, put himself in the place so know where he is in the first in the kingly part so you, you've placed the mob as part of the, the third part or you have no we were kind of calling the king's advisors and Haman he we kind of were saying he was he was kind of the mob Although he was also deceiving the king, so. Yeah, so he's that 
one that's exalted itself to the position of authority, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, of course, that's where that's where downfall comes. So, Babylon falls when it exalts itself. So here, Haman is exalting himself, and he's actually manipulating and exploiting the king for his own meat. And so, you know, so he's actually putting himself at the very top, and the king is in the best position. And they're you really free as the as the the third part of the kingdom here. I'm sorry, we missed that part. What was the last thing you said? They're using the, the written decree becomes the third part of the kingdom. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It goes forward. So. Um, okay, so now I see the three parts of God's kingdom. It's Mordecai, Esther, and the written and 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 sealed the second. Um, yes. Law reversing. Right. Okay. Right. So the law. So you see the three parts of the, of the two kingdoms that are contra contrary, but you also see how they they almost parallel each other. Mm -hmm. So Satan forms his kingdom after the kingdom of God, like it or has the appearance of it, but obviously. Uh, it's, it speaks like a dragon. It's not based on the same principle. So I took Sorry. a left. So I took a left earlier in the night and started asking about the um, the little time of trouble. Can you explain how you? How would you explain the little time of trouble? How would I explain? That? Uh, the little time of trouble, shaking that takes place. Or the great time of trouble so um you know shake shake what happens is that god sends you know there's always a little test for the big test and so what what happens is that that's what the little time of trouble is called it, it, it's the small t the little test for the great test and of course you know obviously like Jer god says to jeremiah run with the, the foot soldiers and i can build run horses and that's the same idea so God sent a little test to prepare us to, to shake us and so that we can we wrestle with God to become dependent. And that's when, because that's what's for us to take the big test. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's I would answer the question about this little time of trouble and the big time of trouble. But those, those are really Adventist terms. I mean, you never find that anywhere else. Thank you. I was just looking at this quote from Ellen White here in regard to this chapter. It says, the decree that will finally go forth against the remnant people of God will be very similar to that issued by Ahasuerus against the Jews. Today, the enemies of the true church see it in the little company keeping the Sabbath commandment a Mordecai at the gate. The reverence of God's people for his law is a constant rebuke to those who have cast off the fear of the Lord and are trampling on his Sabbath. Satan will arouse indignation against the minority who refuse to accept popular customs and traditions. Kind of sounds like Daniel 11 there. There was written according to all that Haman had, oops, sorry, position and reputation will join with the lawless and the vile to take counsel against the people of God. Wealth, genius, education, will combine to cover them with contempt. Persecuting rulers, ministers, and church members will conspire against them. With voice and pen, by boasting threats and ridicule, they will seek to overthrow their faith. By false representations and angry appeals, men will stir up the passions of the people, not having a thus saith the scriptures to bring against the advocates of the Bible Sabbath. They will resort to oppressive enactments to supply the lack. Their popularity and patronage legislatures will yield to the demands for Sunday laws, but those who fear God cannot accept an institution that violates a precept of the Decalogue, and it goes on. But I, I find verse four to be very, very, um, very illuminating 
And it says here, these are the servants when they came, to, they, they were, they're at the gate. They say when it comes to pass, when they spake daily to him, they <coughs> him otherwise. And he hearkened not unto them. That they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand for he, that is Mordecai, had told them that he was a Jew. And this is astounding that um, Mordecai, when push comes to shove, um, um, shares why he is not bowing, that he is holding um, to, the, to the most high and that he, he's following uh, God's kingdom. Um, come what may. Um, this is uh, this is like uh, Azariah, Michelle, and Hananiah, mm -hmm. um, and Daniel. It's, uh, mm -hmm. Yes, it's beautiful. Uh, yeah. So we see what the wrath is in in Haman, right? Mm -hmm. Full of wrath. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it just you know he roars more like a lion when um, he's not given dominion. Which, which again, which will happen to, there was another thing just lately in, in some article that I read about the fundamentalists being terrorists and, and, and how they are connected to QAnon. QAnon, I have, mm -hmm. I have no idea what QAnon is, but Me um, they, they, they actually specifically brought up October 22 and its connection um, to this. Mm -hmm. I. I I took highlights of, of that whole thing. I, I don't know what QAnon is, but but again, just you know, that that's the beginning of it. You know, it's the beginning of the the, the setting setting their eyes on uh, on those that aren't aren't following or honoring uh, the worldly system and what's going on now, and, and, right. and just being full of wrath and just. You know, wanting yeah. to take them out. Chewing on it. And you can see that Mordecai here, um, you can see uh, the, the genetic, um, the passing of those genes to Esther, because I'm trying to look for the verse in chapter 201, where she followed what Mordecai had said. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah. here's growing, I don't know if anybody can find that verse. I, I don't have my real Bible. Well, that that's in two. What um, verse? Is that? Well, twenty verse twenty. Now Esther had not revealed the kindred and her people, just as Mordecai had charged her, for Esther obeyed the command of Mordecai as when she was brought up by him. So she, you can see the influence of her uncle, um, and it, one can take hope in charge uh, i take hope in charge from that that the uh the training of our children in the way that they should go um mm -hmm. that hopefully it will take root at some point in time in their life as we continue to pray for them and uh, this is what um i think strengthened through the holy spirit strengthened us to do what you did do mm -hmm. uh, amen it's encouraging hmm. Well, folks, I've enjoyed it, but it's time yeah. for me to get some rest. So, God so bless. So, do you want to? Do you want to have closing prayer then, there, sir? Um, I can. I can do that. Let's bow our heads. Yeah. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the door that you are opening, the light that you are shining upon us. We're so thankful, Father for your amazing love and showing us so clearly what is ahead for us if we are to be truly um, citizens of your kingdom. So Father, we ask that you would send your spirit to continue to draw us, um, to, to give us courage, um, but most of all, Father, to give us insights about ourselves, about the principles that we are living our lives lives upon, uh, the principles that we make our day-to-day -day decisions um, with, and that you would show us clearly 
um, and give us strength and courage to move to change those things that you might that we might confess our sins and that you might heal us of these things that are um, well that are our inheritance from our parents mm. Father, again, I want to thank you for this group. I want to praise your name for your word, but especially for the gift that we have in Jesus Christ, that promise that he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We thank you, we praise you, and we lift your name up. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good night, everybody. Good night, Brian. Good night, Brian. Good night, Brian. Good night. Hey, well. so I have a quick question too. Did uh, was that recorded the um, yesterday's um, study on Daniel? Yes. Right. Okay. We uh, Donnie has um, he's been working on that. He's uh, he's okay. uploading I think uh, four over this past weekend with Pastor Tim okay. that we have, and last night's, and then he'll do tonight. So, yeah, okay. this should, it should be up. I look forward to appreciate all the work he does with that. So. Yes. Amen. Amen. Do you have a trip to California or are you still in California? I'm in Texas right now, San Antonio, um, at a conference. And um, Monday, I'll be heading to see my daughter in California. So, nice. nice. Yeah. It, uh, uh, it's a nice Wonderful. place. The River Walk. I don't know if you anybody been to San Antonio. Yes. I yeah, have a couple of times. Have you? Yeah. Uh, I've been there, Jim. My son lives in Burlington now. Okay. Yeah. But he was in McAllen for okay. nine years. So I've been on that. That's gorgeous. It really is. Yeah, pretty, yeah. 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 I did my basic training here at Lachlan Air Force Base, but uh, I never got off. Um, <laughs> I never got off the uh, training center because I was a bad boy. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I got. I got placed as latrine queen. Um, <laughs> and in, in the middle of the night, the DIs came in and they completely, I won't tell you what they did, but they completely destroyed um, the latrine. And um, had to, I had to get up with the other guys and we had to clean their mess up. It was it was not pleasant. Oh, dear. Oh, no. I'm going to be a bad person again. <laughs> Go on the river walk. You'll love it. Yes. Okay. Yeah, Good night, everybody. That. <laughs> nice. Blessings. Oh, Pastor, nice. can I ask you a quick question? Sure. So, I, a long time ago, you gave a sermon in Williston on 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes. And in that sermon, I, I have written unconditional love is not biblical. Right. Can you just explain that? Yeah. I mean, I understand unconditional salvation. I mean, salvation is not unconditional. But love? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Because the, the idea of the, this, uh, this concept of unconditional love, first of all, you don't see it. It's not, it's not put in the scriptures. You never see um, we like because because we say God is love, then we we try to use this phrase um, of unconditional love conditions on it to describe this idea that God loves us no matter what. But you don't need to say unconditional love to say that God loves you no matter what. The point is that um, this because a phrase unconditional love is used in our world and in our church to 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 describe to tell people well you're sinning and it's okay it doesn't matter god loves you anyway mm -hmm. well and the is is it it's true that god loves by the way god doesn't stop loving god loves satan right god loves lucifer lucifer isn't loving himself so the point but the point is the idea our idea of love you know warm fuzzy feeling thing but the truth is that when when god destroys like for example, that's love. That's an act of love. Right. So, um, but the word, the way we use the phrase "unconditional love" is not, it's not actually mm -hmm. biblical. The way that we use it. So that's why. I see. Would the word "agape" be more appropriate? He, he just uh, buzzed off. Um, he's probably going to try to get back on. Um, 
But I think we, we put the conditions on there. We want to put conditions on love. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we want to um, give the parameters, you know, in our human thinking. Mm -hmm. mm. Yes. Good question. Mm. Good question. Well, that I we uh, Lena and I got a little chuckle because you're not going to believe what her and Jen were talking about on their way over here. Um, uh, they were talking about how they look like each other, and she said, "Mommy, nobody ever tells me I look like you." <laughs> and then, <laughs> then you say that, and she was just like, "Mommy, mommy." <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it funny how God works? You know? oh, and she's so cute. funny because she says, Lena, you look like me in Azalea. And it's so true. So well, cute. That, that was going to be my second question. Is it Azalea? <laughs> and I said, why would Azalea be at your house? It's like, yeah, no, they definitely all look yeah. alike. <laughs> yeah. So oh, cute. That's cute. I wanted to surprise Jim. That's why I said I'd be in and out. Uh -huh. Oh, that was good. <laughs> Dr. Tim, um, Dr. Raymond, would you say agape would be a better word? Yeah, well, agape means self-sacrificing love, right? Yeah. So, yes. I. We try to... The problem with the word love, that we need to be careful because we try to project our idea of love on God as God is love. When in fact we're supposed to be looking at God to figure out what love is, and then and then adopting ourselves and our understanding of love to who God is, and mm -hmm. what what's happened in our culture is it's being turned around, and so God is being painted as this you know this loving teddy bear is going to come at the second coming and he's just going to love and accept everybody because he has unconditional love, so it doesn't matter what you're doing you know you're saved in the kingdom and everything's okay you know this lo lovely little teddy bear is going to come and give you a hug well I'm sorry. The second coming is not going to be anything like that. Right. And, you know, they God is. <laughs> What's that? Antediluvian said that, that God would never, you know, those that still believed in God, he would never send a flood. He, he's a loving God. Right, right. Because he is a loving God. That's why he is sending the flood. Yeah. Because he love respects the will and the choices of the people and gives them what they're choosing. And so, you know, that's where... You know that's why the pic this picture of God needs to be it needs to be straightened out. Now you know th there's the same thing in Jesus' day. There was people had this picture, this harsh picture of God, and Jesus showed them that he that God is a God of love, but Jesus did not show them that God is is a, a God that's just going to wink his eye at everything that we do wrong and and accept us anyway. That's just not the way it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And you know when he when they uh, when he cursed the fig tree and when he uh, when he uh, gave the woes to the scribes and the Pharisees and the whole story of Ananias and Sapphira in the New Testament just kind of, you know, blows most people's minds about, well, this isn't what God is like. Well, I'm sorry that your picture of God is wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, God has to give people what they're choosing. That's love. And when, yeah. if they, if they don't choose life, then he has to give them death. And so, you know, that's, that's kind of what I was trying to share. I'm, I had run into a number of people that summer, I think, uh, mm -hmm. when I was giving that sermon, they were talking about this unconditional love of God. And so it means that they were justified in what they were doing, even though they knew it was wrong because God loved them anyway. And, and I, I just, you know, that's yeah. just not true. So I've that's where the those people, <laughs> I've met several of those people. Yeah. And it's so sad. Yeah. Mm hmm. Okay. Thank you. Are you usually here on Thursday nights? No, I I I, I try to be, but I've missed the last the last few I've missed. So I actually, uh, I had a Zoom meeting for the first time with one of my churches tonight, and they they ended at eight o'clock. So I I thought I would jump on and catch the tail end, even though I haven't been reading the Book of Esther, and I I wish I had so I could you know dive in and share. But I mean I have general ideas in my mind, but. I'd love to d dive into the details again, but anyway, yeah. So I just wanted to see you guys. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 
Did you get a good response? Yeah, it's a prayer meeting. Yeah, it was good. It was the first, first time. Uh, I, uh, yeah. We're so still recording here. Some interesting, interesting dynamics going on. So we'll see. Yeah, getting to know each other. That's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> and answering questions and watching the blank looks and knowing mm -hmm. that it's going to take a long time to get them to the point where they actually understand or I can answer the question so they can understand it. So but that's mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. They asked me to study the sanctuary, so I've been uh, starting to study the sanctuary with them. So Amen. that's good. Amen. Yeah, we, we had a good study last night as well um, <laughs> for Daniel 11 and 12. <laughs> oh, good. We had a little bit of a difference of opinion, but, you know, I... I'm not as learned as some of the others, I guess, but I haven't changed my mind, but I'm, I, I admit that I might, I don't know everything. <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she says. <laughs> Your mic's off, Lori. <laughs> yeah. What did you say, Lori? I'm sorry, I missed it. Oh, the close of probation came up. Oh. <laughs> yeah, but Ray and Jim and 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 Craig actually did a very good job of doing an explanation. Mm -hmm. We're going to revisit it again next week. Yeah, it's going to be good. It's going to be good because we're gonna, we all are are just um, looking at what we saw. Now we're all going to be re looking to see what Ellen White um, has said about it. Well, um, I read that and it was pretty clear, but. But it was a process she was explaining. So what you're talking about Ellen White's comments on the on the close of probation? Yes. With Michael standing up? Yes, she she quotes that exactly. Then she goes right into her explanation right after that verse and basically says that all the inhabitants it, all the cases have been decided. Seemed really clear to me at least. Yeah, well, yes. Yeah, well. The, tr the truth is when what she quotes there if you when you read the paragraph she says that christ lifts his hands up and says it is done right the very quote you're talking about mm -hmm. so where's where's that in the bible revelation 22 or maybe 21 it's at the very end well actually it's the seventh plague he lifts his hands up and says it is done that's the seventh plague mm -hmm. so she quotes she's quoting She's quoting Daniel 12, 1, the beginning of that chapter, describing the time of trouble. And then she goes into the clo close of probation because the time of trouble is the process of the close of probation. She's right. not the time of trouble is the second, the great time of trouble that she's describing. Right. So the point is that when she actually describes the closing of probation, she actually references the seventh plague. So, of course, you know, anybody that studies Revelation knows that, that uh, Christ becomes king long before the seventh plague. Um, so the point here is that Adventists have these these ideas in their their mind that when Christ becomes king or Michael stands up, they think it's the same it's the same idea that they think probation is closed. But see, they're not understanding that close of probation is a process. It's the same as Michael becoming king is a process. They think Michael standing up is like a one one time event that happens at one point. It's not. The standing up of Michael is actually the three, three stage process of him coming out of the sanctuary. And so it is the closing of probation, but probation has not closed. Um, and she, so anyway, that's, that's even part of the, plague, the, even when the plagues have fallen, it's not totally closed for all people. In other words, that's right. Probation has closed for some, but the, when the plague's falling, it hasn't. And you can see in two of the plagues, they said it's it, the Bible is very clear that people refuse to repent. Well, if they're refusing to repent, then is probation closed? Yeah. You could see it either way for that particular one point. It'd have to be a little stronger than that. But. Well, yes, but the point, the fact is that the Bible is saying they're refusing to repent. That means it's their choice not to repent. Close of probation means there is no, then there's no opportunity there's to There's no repent. choice. There's no choice at all. The probation's closed. So... The idea that they refuse to repent means that there's still repentance available. They just refuse to accept it. 
so you know again the very language of the of the, that's the i think the third and fourth plague you really look you look at the language of the plagues and of course god is not in a hurry closing probation for people that's an adventist thing we're in, we're the ones that are in a hurry we think as soon as probation's you know as soon as light shines to us probation's closed for everybody you know, somehow adventists have a hang up about that i don't know why but uh but uh, anyway, a lot of the stuff comes from misunderstandings of, of Mel and White quotes. And uh, the truth is that they, there's no scripture to support that. Actually, it's a misunderstanding of scripture because, anyway, you, well, you'll study it for yourself and talk about it next week. But, um, you know, uh, I've tried to share about this for quite a while. Um, I don't uh, the, the Bible is so clear. The judgment of the living takes place when Christ is king. Mm -hmm. And if, if Christ becomes king and probation is closed, then you're, what you're saying is there is no judgment of the living. The living don't have a choice. Well, of course, that's not true. Um, of course, Adventists use these phrases, but they never put them in any biblical context. And that's why I'm trying to use the sanctuary and the whole steps of the sanctuary and the Christ becoming king and the process in the sanctuary to show so it gives clarity to these things. Mm -hmm. I thought we were being judged now. Yes, but so so the well, yes, but so the judgment of the living is actually the process where people are making choices and they're sealed in that choice, right? Right, and they're sealed either for they're, the seal of God, is, and then there's the seal of the beast. The mark of the beast is actually a seal. So both are, there's a choice that's made, and then there's a sealing that takes place. Right. And the four winds are not released until the servants are sealed in their forehead. Yes. Our servants are sealed earlier. Right. Okay. Of course, when you, when you talk about that, you're actually in the, in the sixth seal, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're way up in, in Revelation 6 and 7. So, wow. Our third so, angel. When probation yeah. closes in Revelation chapter 6 and 7. I'm thinking of uh, third oh. angel. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm just, I don't know. I mean, you know more th than I. I'm just reading it, you know, for what it appears to be that, that the, the four winds are not released until the servants are sealed in their foreheads, which means right. that once they're sealed, the four winds are released. It seems to be. That's right. But see, the see, the servants that they're talking, she's talking about there, are the twelve thousand from the twelve tribes, right? Right, the hundred forty-four thousand. Right. So what happens is that you have, first of all, you have the the first group are are the Elijah messengers. They keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. That's the first group where judgment falls. The second group is the numbered group. That's the the twelve thousand from the twelve tribes. And then the third group is the great multitude. So the point is, is that there's a the close of the probation for the first group isn't the close of probation for the other two. And the same thing, you're talking about the sealing, the servants of God being sealed in their forehead. You, then you're talking about the trumpets, and you're talking about the the twelve the, the twelve thousand from the twelve tribes. But after that, there's judgment goes to the great multitude, mm -hmm. to every nation, tribe, language, and people. And probation hasn't closed for them. So the four winds actually happen that to to bring the chaos that brings the world into chaos that causes the, every nation, the, the great multitude to see that their world's falling apart and they have to make a choice. Are they going to cling to this world? Or are they going to accept Christ? Mm -hmm. So, so again, judgment, the judgment goes out in three stages. That's where the three, that's what the three angels messages are. And of course, each stage has the three stages in it. So the three angels message goes to each stage as well. Right. I do agree so that, there's different aspects of different timing for different people. You know, I guess I just was under the impression that, you know, that the final judgment was different, maybe a little bit. So I don't know. I'm learning. Thank you. Yeah, no, no problem. Well, the yeah, other thing, the other thing that we had discussed there was um, that probation was going to be closed and then God was going to send all the plagues. And, and then remember we said, for what reason would he do that? I remember that. So, and so now, does that make a little bit more sense now? Maybe. I, I'm still trying to figure it out. Okay. Yeah. I I, I I do have some doubts, but you know, I you don't need to waste too much time with me. I'll keep studying. 
it's oh, a that's process. great. It's, it's a, a process. learning process. <laughs> and, you, and you shouldn't pick it just because somebody says it. That's right. I'm, it I'm not the type. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yeah. The, the, the other part I would share with you, since I probably won't be around next week anyway, is that Mrs. White state makes a statement when, when Christ leaves the most holy place that all cases have been decided. That's the statement that she uses. That's usually the one that Adventists, you know, obviously right. we think in our mind, well, Jesus left, left the most holy place. Well, see, the, but, the, but the point is, the problem is, is, or the misunderstanding is, is that when, when, the high, when the priest king comes out of the sanctuary, when he goes from the altar, the, the, the mercy seat, he sprinkles the blood there seven times. Then he goes to the altar of incense. He sprinkles the blood seven times there. But see, when he goes out to the altar of incense in the holy place, the altar of incense is actually called the most holy. And then when he goes to the altar of the burnt offerings in the, in the, in the outer court, he sprinkles blood seven times there. The altar is called the most holy. So her statement is correct that all, when he leaves the most holy, all cases are, are determined. But see, we think that means the second apartment, but it's not. Yeah. Yeah. So the point is, is that we, we again, if we had studied the Bible, we would have a different perspective of Mrs. White's statement. But because we think she's just talking about the second apartment, then we right. think that when he leaves us the, the, the most, what we call the most holy place, that, mm -hmm. that every case has been decided. So she's, she's being biblically accurate. We're just not studying the Bible, so we don't understand what she's saying. And right. so we take something that she said and make it mean something that she never meant. Right. And it's that's, because that's, right. Right. See, that's where I found the problem in the past. Right. Well, it's just like the Daniel 2 statue that we all believe that you know, that meant the second coming when it doesn't parallel at all to be the second right. coming. And right. And there's... Uriah Smith said it. You know, I'm beginning to think almost everything that Uriah Smith said, I don't agree with. <laughs> say. I can't think of anything hardly. I agree with Uriah Smith. Yeah. The more I hear, I, anyways. Yeah. I came well, home one day and found the Uriah Smith's Daniel Revelation book in the trash. <laughs> <laughs> but he he was a good historian, but but when he tried to apply, when he tried to give his interpretation of the prophecies, you know he you know he he just didn't he just didn't understand. I mean, he was a great historian, but he never carried the principles forward. And so he had a very a shortened view. And of course, I, I, you know, I can't be hard on him. You know, a lot of them believe that, that Christ was supposed to come in 1844 and they were looking for him to come right afterwards. And they didn't. So they were they had this cut short idea. You know, of course, we're here. We are sitting 177 years later, realizing this is not a cut short idea. There's a whole process that still needs to happen. And that never even dawned on their minds. So. No. Yeah, it's just, it's the same thing with that. I mean, there's nowhere in scripture that you find a stone, a stone coming down, hitting a statue is a second coming. No, no, nowhere in the Bible does it say such a thing. No. And yet you have Adventists that will die over that. I mean, they'll tell okay. you, oh, that's the way it is. It has to be. Uriah Smith said so. It's like, well, okay. that's what I appreciate about you and this group is that it, you're sincerely trying to study for what's, what's the truth. And, you know, that's really, really important. You know, we can't just go by what, this is a problem that we've had through our generations of Catholicism and the Protestant Reformation. We only took it as far as the reformers, the pioneers of each reformer, and we didn't carry on to be Bereans to the scripture. And, and this is what got to change. Right, that's right. Well, I will share with you since you're, you're talking about Ellen White quotes, the Ellen White quote that you're talking about, she wrote in early writings about Christ leaving the, the when he leaves the most holy place. One in the Great Controversy. Yeah, well, in the Great Controversy, when she makes that statement, she doesn't say when he leaves the most holy place. She she changes yes. the statement to yeah. say when he leaves the sanctuary. And so, by, by the way, the point is that both statements mean the same thing to me now that I've studied the Bible. So she's saying the same thing. But when she says, so when she writes Great Controversy, she changes the way she says it because she's changing the picture in people's minds. So she says that when he leaves the sanctuary, all cases are, are decided. And see, that's a more clear picture. That's, that's accurate. Because yeah. the, 
the, the sprinkling of the blood seven times is the whole sanctuary. So when he leaves the sanctuary, then every case is decided. And by right, the way, I now guess, you're now you're I in guess, Revelation 21 and 22. Right. I guess the part that I'm still hung up on a little bit, and I don't want to take up too much of your time because I know you're busy, but no. I'm still trying to hung up on the fact that she's actually quoting Daniel chapter one. Chapter Daniel one. Daniel 12, one. One, yeah. She's actually yeah. quoting that in that context. Yes, because the title of the chapter is Time of Trouble. Well, but it's the same paragraph. Right. But she's quoting the whole text, right? She's quoting Daniel 12, 1. Because right. Daniel 12, 1 is the text that talks about the time of trouble. There should be a time of trouble that such has never been. That's what she's quoting. Right. That's right. Right. So, yes. So the point is that the time of trouble is the closing of probation. It's the judgment of the living. That's, what, that's why it's trouble. And people are, are having to make a choice mm. so that you know that she's exactly correct that's what she what you're supposed to be quoting but you see in daniel 3 you are see in daniel 12 better, what's that i'm sorry what, you're saying what we do is we read into that our preconceived biases that's yeah. right that's right we Can do. I, let me just quote something um because this helped me a lot this is from um early writings some of us have had time to get the truth and to advance step by step. And every step we have taken has given us strength to take the next. But now time is almost finished. And what we have been years learning, they will have to learn in a few months. They will also have much to unlearn and much to learn again. Mm -hmm. Those, so, and I, you know, I, I, I find that with us now um, too. Mm -hmm yeah see the only reason i i wouldn't even talk about it if it didn't matter but the point is is that what happens is that adventists come to this point where probation's closed and then they just write off everything at that point well probation's already closed so you know there, there's nothing going on there's nothing we need to worry about but see that's the that's the danger because it, probation isn't closed for everyone it's a judgment of the living and that's the time that light is supposed to shine so people can make choices that's the very time God doesn't want people, doesn't want his people shutting off. You know, there's, mm -hmm. that's when we're supposed to be awake, awakening up. You know, Daniel 12 talks about people awakening. It doesn't talk about people shutting off. Right. And so Adventists use this closed probation as if it's a, like a flip off switch. Well, I don't have to care about anything more. Probation's closed. No, that, no, that's not how it works. And they, and they, and they attach that to Michael. And the, the, the strange thing is that Daniel 12, three says that at that time, the, the wise will shine like the stars in the sky and lead many to righteousness. Well, right. how is that possible if probation's closed? You can't right. lead people to righteousness after the close of probation. So the, again, the, the very text, the, you know, the Bible that we quote, it, we're supposed to be based on the Bible. You can't, so you have all these contradictory, well, probation's closed, Daniel 12, 1, okay. And Daniel 12, 3, which is in the context of Michael standing up, these these right, righteous are going to shine like the stars and lead many to righteousness. Oh, well, that's not possible. Probation's already closed. Yeah. So it's like, it's, so we don't it's make sense. And I, and I do think it is, at least that portion is chronological. Daniel 11 seems to be pretty, you know, historic-wise chronological and going into 12 so that would make sense you know yeah well it, it, of course it is chronological because that's where the idea of the king of the north is is you know the tidings from the east and the north that's what daniel 12 1 is describing michael standing up is the tidings from the east and the north right so cause that's the coming of course it, the context are, is very clear there in daniel 11 standing up means that he's become king right and then, of course, you have the whole 1290, 1335 days in 1260 being repeated in Daniel 12 in the context of Michael standing up. And, of course, if probation's closed, then it doesn't really matter what you say about those days because who cares? Probation's closed. But the problem is, is that if probation is not closed, then that means those time, those time frames are actually sharing a message that God's people are supposed to be understanding. Amen. And that's part of the problem. I think, you know, we've, we've kind of cut things off as, as if it doesn't matter, and, and it does matter. And, and the point is that, so for that, for that reason, we haven't studied it out, what the, what the, what the meaning is. Mm -hmm. But right. it, time is upon us, so we need to study it. Mm -hmm. And we yeah. were going to say all that next week. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Not as I know when I'm in the minority here. <laughs> 
but not as fluently not. as he just did it. Definitely not as fluently. <laughs> well, there's, there's no more. Well, there's there's no more nowhere. The pr probation is closing. And by the way, at Daniel's fault for Daniel, when Michael stands I'm up for saying I'm the minority with the, that had the opposite view from everybody else. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, that's only because I'm good, Julia. Yes. You're not alone. Yeah. I didn't have an opinion either way because I don't know enough either way. <laughs> well, you know, it, I, I wrestle with these things for just because I was brought up, you know, I was brought up in Ellen White and I had the same mindset. And, and it took a while for, for God to, to show me from the Bible. And I kept saying, yeah, but Ellen White says. And God kept showing me from the Bible. And I kept saying, yeah, but Ellen White says. <laughs> At some point, it was just this pause going, you're quoting Ellen White to refute the Bible? What's wrong with your head here? You can't know? do that. The Bible has to come first. Yeah, she, and the truth is. The Bible is her, not the opposite. That's right. And she is actually in harmony with the scriptures. And, and so, by the way, that's one of the things I wrestled with. And then God showed me. Well, no, Ellen White is not in, not out of harmony with the Bible. It's your understanding of Ellen White that's out of harmony with the Bible. And I've, right. I've seen this in multiple places over multiple issues. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you when you say to somebody, we're going to study the close of probation, what people do is they go and they look up Ellen White, the close of probation, and look at all the Ellen White quotes on the close of probation, and that's their study of the close of probation. They don't even open the Bible. Yeah. So, that's what she says exactly not to do that's right so anyway right. yeah that's my hair that's my heresy for the evening well thank you for joining us i like <laughs> yeah. that thanks pastor tan <laughs> i'll go well, to I, I, where's the heresy class i want to go <laughs> I, was, I was actually i was actually being selfish i just wanted to see your friendly faces and say hi uh, we, and, then, we and, then, too. and then and then Jeff goes and asks me to give a summation of chapter three. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> what I, I probably read. I, I think I read Esther three, chapter three, maybe six months ago. <laughs> well, funny. well, thank you for coming on. We appreciate all right. It. Yeah. Good night, all. Good night. Good night. God bless. God bless, okay. God bless everyone. Hey. I will be Everyone trying to do as often as I can. Good night. Good night. Good night.